consider, as of last week, the commentary section on Hebrews chapter 11. Up to this point, we've had mention of different characters of the Old Testament, and the writer of Hebrews has chosen to place a commentary about that person's life. There have been a mention that we have made of 15 different people. And now the writer comes to this particular verse and he says, you know, I wish I could write more, but I really can't. And he begins to just list the names of others who were servants of God that had faith in God. We come to verse 32 that I read. The author lists for us four judges, one king, a prophet, and then a host of all other prophets. And much could be written about them, but he leaves it for us to go back and actually do the searching ourselves. The writer gives to us here today the mention of one of these individuals that we're going to cover. It's the man, Gideon. We are brought back, and I'm going to invite you to turn now back to the Old Testament, to the book of Judges and chapter number 6. We're going to highlight some sections here in Judges 6 and 7. Now just so you can have some background and some understanding about where we're going, the book of Judges covers a period of about 400 years. There is a repeated cycle throughout the book. In fact, you can read the book, and though the names may be different along the way, the cycle runs the same. What is it? Four words. Rebellion, reprimand, repentance, and restoration. You see, the people of Israel will rebel against God by favoring some other deities and gods of the nations around them. And God will then come along and reprimand His people by following those other gods. Then the people, under the bondage of these other nations, will begin to repent to God and cry out for His help. And what will God do? God will come in and will actually give victory to them and restore them to the relationship that He so desires. And you read through the book of Judges, and here's that cycle that you see going all the way through. When we come to Judges chapter 6, We are in the midst of one of those cycles. Please notice chapter 6, if you will, and verse number 1. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. That's the rebellion. Notice also here, the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. That's God's reprimand. Look at verse number 6. The Bible says Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And what did they do? They cried out unto the Lord. That's their repentance. And the rest of chapter 6 through chapter 7 is God bringing victory to the Israelites and restoring them through this man, Gideon. Now let's go ahead and even step a fur- further back and get some other information that's important. You see, the Israelites are in bondage to this group of people known as the Midianites. Who are the Midianites? Well, the Midianites are traced all the way back to Genesis chapter 25 and verses 2 and 4, where a man by the name of Midian, a boy, actually a child, a baby, is born to Abraham, and and not Sarah, the first wife, but a woman by the name of Keturah. And to those two is born this son, Midian. From there, all the descendants of this boy are known as the Midianites. And really, from the time of Isaac, which is God's promised son, from that time, the Midianites have been a thorn in the side of the Israelites, the followers of Abraham and Isaac. And it's here in this time that the Midianites are bothering the Israelites during a particular time of the year, harvest time. You see, during this time, when they're getting ready to harvest the grain, the Midianites would come in with their chariots 
and would take all of the wheat for themselves and whatever they could not use, they would burn. For seven years, the Midianites would do this. They began to cry out to God and say, God, why is this happening? Why are these people coming in and taking what is there to be for us? It's very interesting to note the application to our lives. Because I believe that this whole scene that we read about is very analogous to our lives. And that is, the word Midian literally means strife or contention. Do you have strife or contention in your life? Do you have things in your life that you seem to hold on? You say, well, Pastor, I'm not sure I get the correlation here for just a minute. Let me ask you, is there some sin in your life that you're holding on that causes problems? Is there some habit that you're not able to give up that is causing a great amount of contention in your life? Maybe it's an issue that's been in your life for years and it's just constantly causing problems. And you're here today and you say, I don't know how to fix it. I've got these problems in my life. It's wreaking havoc in my life. And you're in constant upheaval and fear and defeat. And just about when you're ready to have a time of harvest in your life, all of a sudden the enemy comes in and he destroys the progress that you've made. But that's where God comes through. Because what we read in chapter 6, God comes through with a messenger and with a message to a particular individual to rise up over that strife and contention and by faith claim the victory that God has. I want to give you a few things here this morning as we talk about this man Gideon as a judge overcoming the Midianites, that strife and contention. Number one, I want you to notice, according to chapter 6, verses 1 through 21, you must have faith in God's call on your life. You must have faith in God's call on your life. Notice, if you will, let me read beginning in verse number 7. So we've given a little bit of the introduction in verses 1 through 6, but verse 7, it says, And it came to pass... When the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel. And he says, look, I've brought you out of Egypt. I've brought you out of the house of bondage. I've delivered you out of them, those people who oppressed you. And in verse 10, I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites. Well, look at verse 11. There came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was in Ophrah, and pertained unto Joash, and you pronounce the next name, all right? And his son, Gideon. And Gideon threshed the wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Gideon said unto him, O oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, Why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. The Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? I think it's very eye-catching to see that in the midst of confusion, fear, and chaos, God still gets word to His people. He sends a prophet. And then in verse 11, there is an angel of the Lord, which I believe is the Lord Himself that appears to Gideon. A theophany or a Christophany, the appearance of Christ Himself, right to Gideon to call him to overcome that strife and contention. And the Lord simply comes to Gideon and calls him to do what should have already been done to defeat this enemy. Again, seven years, this strife and contention. And all of what the Lord says to him when he calls him. Verse 12, the Lord's with you. Verse 14, go Gideon because I've sent you. 
Now, wouldn't it be nice to read this story when God calls Gideon, that Gideon says, yes, sir, and does God's will. But how many of you are like that? How many of you, when God asks you to do something, you immediately stand attention and say, yes, sir. You know what Gideon does? God calls Gideon, I love the first words he used, thou mighty man of valor. Now here's a man that is actually in a little hole that's been dug. He is actually threshing the wheat in a wine press. Now a wine press is an area that's dug out into a rock or in a, a hole in the ground to where they put the grapes in there and they crush the grapes and get the juice. So Gideon is hiding in this hole, if you will, and you understand threshing wheat, you got to be out in the open air in order to throw that up and the wind to take the chaff and to blow it away. So Gideon's in this hole listening for any Midianites and he throws a little hay up hoping some chaff will blow away and he's in fear and God says, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon kind of looks around and says, who are you talking to? God was talking to him, thou mighty man of valor. And I love his response here about how he doesn't feel that God can do anything. In fact, he begins to say to the Lord, Lord, if you really were in control of things and you really were able to do some things, where have you been? Now, how many people have said that when they've had strife and contention in their life? Sin has wreaked havoc in them, and there's been problems in their, in their life, and they, they're, they're, they're confused about which direction to go. And then God begins to call them through a preacher, through a message, through the Word of God, and they say, God, where have you been all this time? That's where Gideon was. Gideon's confused even further. And yet when God comes to him, God begins to tell him, Gideon, I've got a job for you to do. But Gideon begins to respond further. Well, you don't understand. I've been confused about where you've been at, but you don't even understand. Uh, uh, My family is very poor, and uh, you take my whole family. I'm the least of all my family, and so I have no ability, no capability to do anything. God, you're looking in the wrong direction. I can't overcome that enemy. And I love what God says to him in verse number 14. Notice this. In verse 14, he says, Go in this thy might. Now, if you've been saved for a long time, and you've been in this church, you understand that we have talked many times, you cannot do God's work in your strength. It's all God's strength. God tells us that He gives us the victory through Him. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10, we're to do it in His might. Colossians chapter 1, verse 11. So what do you mean God tells Him to do this and to go in your might? I'll tell you what this is all about. You see, there were some things that Gideon could do, and there were some things that Gideon could not do. You see, Gideon, in verse number 20, could take the flesh, the meat, the unleavened bread, place them out on the rock. Chapter 6, verse 24, he could build an altar. Chapter 6, verse 25, he could take the bullock from his father's herd, tear down the altar to Baal, and build up an altar to God. Verse 34, he could blow a trumpet. Verse 35, he could go out and send messengers. And on and on it could go. There were things that Gideon could do, but do you know what Gideon could not do? He couldn't defeat the enemy. That was God. And the problem with most of us is when there is sin or habit-forming things in our life, we look at the solution and we say, it's impossible, I can't do it. And God says, you're right, you cannot do it. You trust me to do what you cannot do, but you've got to take the initiative. You must take the first step to go forward. And for Gideon it was, take that step, and then he'll see God do some things. You know what our problem is? We sit back and say, God, take this habit away from me. Take this sin away. And we expect God, with our arms folded, sitting in our chair, expecting God to take care of things when God says, that's not the way it works. 
you take the step and I will draw near to you and I will give you the victory. Can I tell you something? God needs and desires to take control, but he wants you to take a step forward. God didn't ask Gideon to do one thing other than what he could do. I love what somebody said one day, God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. That's what God does. God will equip you. You may not see how the victory is going to come, but you take the step forward, God will begin showing. Number two, I want you to notice this. Chapter 6, verses 22 to 7, 27. You must have faith as to who will have control of your life. You got to have faith as to who will have control of your life. Before Gideon's ever asked to take on the mighty Midianites, God has a special assignment for him. It doesn't seem related to chapter 7 and, and conquering the Midianites, but it has everything to do with it. You see, Gideon has asked to cut down the altar that the Midianites had set up and actually was an altar that his father had. And God says, Gideon, I want you to do this. I want you to tear down that altar that is to all these other gods, and I want you to build up this altar to me. I say, preacher, what does that have to do with anything? Here's what an altar is all about. An altar is all about worship. An altar is all about confession of sin. And you see, when one comes to God at the altar, when one comes to God to worship Him, they are saying, God, I need to be controlled by You. I give my allegiance to You. You are the one that can forgive sin. You are the one that can help me out. And what God, what Gideon is doing is, he's tearing down what is wrong in his life, the wrong allegiances, and he's building up what is right in his life. You know what some of you need to do today? You need to give your allegiance to God and recognize God has to be number one in your life. God has to be in control. I love the bumper sticker. I, I get a kick out of it, though I don't think it's, it, it's true and it should be applied to our life. You ever seen that bumper sticker that God is my uh, co-pilot? My friend, I want to tell you something. God, you ought to get out of that pilot seat and say, God, you're not my co-pilot. You are the pilot. You see, God is going to take control. And the problem with many of you is you're trying to fix things on your own. You're trying to go to this seminar and that thing and this area and trying to figure out how you can fix it. When you're going to step back and say, God, you're number one in my life. I'm building up an altar to you. I'm tearing down these altars to these gods that I have. And I am going to have you take control of my life. Number three, I want you to notice this. I want you to notice in chapter 6, verses 36 to 40. Not only must you have faith in God's call, not only must you have faith about who's in control, but number three, you got to have faith with no conditions. Think about this. Faith with no conditions. This portion of Scripture is where we get the Christian terminology, putting out a fleece. How many have ever heard that phrase before? I'm putting out a fleece, all right? Sure. We've all used it probably. Oh, I don't know about this decision here, but I'm putting out a fleece. Putting out a fleece. Now, I'm not saying that uh, there can't be circumstances where maybe God isn't hasn't revealed things very specifically in his word and maybe that you put out a fleece to God but I am saying this that when God does speak clearly in his word no fleece is going to help you in fact a fleece putting out before God is putting a test to God when God has already made things clear in his word Gideon notice in verse 36 He uses the word, if. Gideon said unto God, if thou wilt save Israel. Now, I didn't point this out earlier, but when God was calling Gideon, God said to Gideon, Gideon, you're going to go in and you're going to defeat this enemy as if you were able to defeat one man. Like that. 
And Gideon comes before God and has the audacity to say, uh, uh, God, if, if you'll do this. And I'll tell you what, let me just figure out if you're going to do this, God. And I love this test. I, I'm going to put out this little uh, mat in front of my house. And uh, tonight, if that mat is dry and all the ground around it is wet, then I'll know that God has done it. Well, guess what? God did something. The next night, Gideon still is in unbelief. And Gideon comes before God and says, I'll tell you what, God, if, uh, if the mat at that night is wet, but all the ground around is dry, then I'll know that you do it. And guess what God does? God makes it happen. Now, is this a lesson for us that we're to put fleeces out before God? I don't think so. Because I think our problem is this, is that if you and I depend more on the signs than on God's Word, then that's what we're always going to be looking towards. God's Word makes it clear that our obedience to Him is given to us in the Word of God. But I believe He includes this section in, in there to show us the very patience of God with us when we're in unbelief, and we're, all, we're often there, aren't we? Now, I want to tell you something here today. What's the problem in this area of faith without conditions, putting out a fleece before God? It's presuming upon God. It's presuming upon God. You see, what God has already made clear in His Word, what God has already told us to do to defeat the enemy, you and I have no business putting a fleece out before God. You say, Pastor, do people do that all the time? Here's things that I've heard. You ready for this? God, I know I not, ought not to be sleeping around, but if you'll take this sexual desire away from me, I'll behave myself. It's putting a fleece out before God. God, I know this boyfriend or girlfriend is not right for me, but if you don't want me in this relationship, then cause this relationship to be broken up on its own. It's a fleece before God. Lord, I know that this friend is not a good influence in my life, and if you really don't want me to be around them, then cause them to move away. Lord, I know these habits are destroying my body, my relationship, and my testimonies, but if you want me to quit, then go ahead and just take the urge away. Now, let me ask you a question. Could God do any of the things that I said about? Yes, of course He could. God could do any, but you know what? It's putting God to the test. You see, God has made it clear what it comes about our relationships. God has made it clear about where the victory comes. And you and I, in doubting what God can do, puts out all these fleeces and says, God, I, I still need to know. And what we're doing is we're expecting God to do the work when he says, you step forward and do the work. Number four, I want you to notice chapter number seven. And this is a great chapter. Number four, you must have faith that God can. You see, you need faith in God's calling to overcome the strife and the contention. You need faith that God is to be in control. You need faith without any conditions. But I believe according to chapter 7, you've got to have faith that God can. I think this is one of the classic stories that we read about is found in chapter 7. All of you, if you've been in church for a long time, been in Sunday school, I remember being in Sunday school learning this story. God tells Gideon, as he's about ready to go to war, that there's a problem. Now, Gideon's, Gideon's already gone out, sent the messengers, gotten all the people. He's got 32,000 people. But he's looking across the way, and he sees 135,000 on the other side. Now, if you're the general, wouldn't you already know there's a problem? God comes to Gideon and God says, Gideon, we got a problem right now. Gideon says, you're telling me. We're outnumbered. God says, Gideon, I want you to know something. You've got too many people. And I want you to tell all those that are still afraid to leave. Now, Gideon's probably hoping, all right, just a few are going to leave. 22,000 leave. 22,000. He's left with 10,000. God comes to Gideon again, and God says, Gideon, we got a problem. Gideon says, you're telling me. God says, we got too many here. 
He says, take them down to the river and let them get over there and take a drink from the river. And all of those that get on their knees and go ahead and put their face down to the water, he says, let those go. But those that just go down and take the water and still are looking around for the enemy, he says, you keep. You know how many people didn't do things right? He's left with 300 men. Of 450 to 1 odds. But you know why God did this? Because God wanted Gideon and all Israel to know that when there was a victory, it was not them, it was God. And my friend, I want to challenge you about something. When you overcome that strife and contention in your life, and you overcome that sin habit, and you overcome all of those problems that are just wreaking havoc and confusion and fear, you can attest to the fact that God gave you the victory. It wasn't you. You just stepped forward. You did what you could, but it was God who gave the victory. I love this. God gave the victory. And when God is on your side helping you, you and God make a majority. Now, what an interesting strategy that God has for the victory. He told Gideon to give the army of Israel the signal. And at the signal, they were to, have, they were to light their torches, put them inside these pitchers, that was clay jars, And then they were to break the jars, and there'll be a tremendous crash all around the camp of the Midianites. This is at night. They're to blow their trumpets, and that'll be a flare, there'll be a flare of light all around the place, and they're to shout at the top of their voice, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And not much of a military strategy, is it? But it's an actual fact of what they did. It struck terror in the hearts of the people. The Midianites turned on themselves, and the Lord gave a mighty victory. Can God give you victory? Sure He can. But you have to trust in God's provision. You have to trust in God's way and what He can do. As I close here today, I want you to notice here Three things that these 300 men had for their victory. Trumpets, pitchers, that's clay jars, and lamps. The trumpet stood for boldness. Sounding that trumpet to let the Midianites know that God's giving us the victory. The clay pitchers stands for brokenness. You see, God has placed His treasure in you who are born again, who are earthen vessels, and for that light to shine, guess what has to happen? That earthen vessel has to be broken. You know what the problem with most of us is? We're prideful. We think we can handle it. We think we can do it. We think we can overcome everything. And God says, you can't. It's got to be broken. And when the clay jar is broken, then my light can shine forth. And I'm looking here at an audience of another number of people that I know who have gotten saved or who have gotten right with God, and guess what? You're able to give a light to the whole world around you of not how great you are, but of how great God is. My friend, we serve a great God. What are you going through today? What are you wrestling with? What's the strife and the contention in your heart? What is it that you need to go ahead and give over to God? God's calling some today. Last Sunday we had some decisions that were made and some great decisions that went on of people who said, you know what, I'm coming back, I'm coming to the Lord, I'm giving these things over. And I want to tell you something, until you surrender your life to God, You're going to continue going through that strife and contention. You must realize God's calling right now. Right now, God's coming in through every pew, and He's starting to whisper. He knows, I may not know what you're wrestling with. I may not know what your strife and contention is, but the Holy Spirit does. And the Holy Spirit's tapping you on the shoulder and saying, here's the problem. You have to give it to God. 
You have to realize that I've got to trust God to help me overcome these things. Shall we bow our heads, please, and close our eyes? Father, thank you for this day. Thank you.